Well, welcome to the Round Pen. Thank you for uh, letting us in your home on this uh, Wednesday evening. We're glad that you're with you. With uh, we're glad that you're with us, and uh, we hope that uh, you got your Bibles, got the family around, and are participating in these Bible studies. Um, just to clarify, what's going to be happening on Wednesday nights for a while? Uh, obviously, we are roaring and ready to get the kids' barn kicked back open, but. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that it's going to happen anytime immediately, uh, so we'll we'll be with you and, and getting with you on uh, how things are going to unfold for us to get back into the full swing and get the kids back in their ministry and all that, uh, but it's not going to happen in the very immediate sense. Uh, I will tell you this, that uh, we, in case you didn't know, we had our first in-house meeting last Sunday. We gathered back in here. Uh, obviously, we have to follow the protocol. Uh, of the governor, and uh, we did that, so we'll be doing that again this Sunday, uh, and for those of you who uh, don't want to come into the building, speakers will be on the front porch of the church, and you will be able to sit in your cars and listen to the service, listen to the worship, so make plans to be here with us Sunday, and uh, it's just good to get back into God's house. First uh, Corinthians chapter 4, uh, starting at verse 1 is where we're going to start tonight. Paul is still addressing the issue <clears throat> of divisions in this Corinthian church. Uh, he's actually been uh, following this subject ever since the beginning of this letter to the Corinthians. It's a serious issue in this church, as it would be uh, in any church. And uh, the reason being, there's a division uh, uh, and divisions cause fractures, and before you know it, the whole ministry collapses. Some of these believers were following Paul himself, some were following Peter, and some were following the pastor of this church, Apollos. Um, as I've stated before, Scripture says that a house divided will not stand. So it's a very serious issue in this Corinthian this church, uh, and it's a lot that we can learn from Paul's writings here uh, in the 21st century church too. So as we get into chapter 4, Paul is going to call attention to how the Christian, the church member, how he ought to view those who are in the ministry. And really, that's the problem. Uh, their view of who they are as ministers and how God's called them to be. You know, most of the time, uh, people who are in the ministry uh, evangelists, pastors, especially pastors, um, they are uh, uh, evaluated with the wrong criteria, um, such as uh, those who are the most influential and, and those who are the most gifted or the most effective are considered to be the most successful. Those who uh, churches, the membership of the church is very large, those who uh, uh, attend the services on Sunday morning, the number uh, of people, uh, the criteria is that, that, that that's the criteria for a, a large or successful church. The size of the building, the numbers of the building on the campus or the, uh, the, the, the property, um, the academic degrees that uh, that minister might have, the, the letters behind his name, uh, books he's written, conferences that he goes to and speaks at, and so on and so forth. All of these are usually criterias that people use uh, to evaluate whether a minister is successful or not. Uh, lots and lots of different criterias are used to determine uh, one's success, and, and, and they cause people to follow different ministers. Uh, and that's not the best thing to do. Uh, and, and the reason it's not because uh, scriptures don't verify that. And what we're going to look at tonight, Paul actually is going to teach us how the church should look at the minister, uh, how the church should see that man of God according to how God's called him and his position in Christ. He teaches us to properly look at the ministers and understand that the man of God's identity uh, uh, in Christ is not uh, based on some criteria that may be a bit worldly. Uh, it's based on who he is in Christ 
and how he serves under the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 1 of chapter 4, Paul says, I'm just going to read a couple of verses because that's probably all we're going to get to cover tonight. There's a lot to get said in these two verses. I'll read them all the way through and then we'll go back. Verse 1, Paul says, So then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must be proven faithfully. So Paul starts off chapter 4 addressing the same issue, divisions in this uh, Corinthian church. He starts off with these three words, so then men. Who is he referring to when he says men? So then men. Uh, Keeping everything lined up and in context, he's been talking to the church. uh, And so he continues in verse 1 to talk to the church. When he says men, he's referring to Christians, those who would make up the church body there at Corinth. The church ought to regard us us. Who's he talking to when he says us? Who should the church regard when he says us? Well, he's referring in the immediate sense to himself, to Peter. He mentioned Peter over in chapter 1, and he's referring to the church's pastor, Apollos. In the immediate sense, he's referring to those three, but in a broader sense, He's referring to all ministers, even on up to our time today here in the 21st century. He's referring to me. He's referring to Brother Chris. He's referring to other pastors and other evangelists uh, in uh, uh, the ministry. And so he explains uh, that the church ought to uh, regard ministers in this way, first of all. And there's three things that we're going to see in these two verses uh, that uh, the church ought to see in regards to the minister. First thing, he says, so then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ. Servants of Christ. Now that, that term servants there literally means an under rower. <laughs> Rowing a ship, which was something that took place in those days. Uh, These were the uh, lowest galley slaves on the ship. Uh, They were rowing at the bottom of the ship. Now, Paul doesn't use that phrase, uh, speaking of ministers, to belittle them or to demean them or to lower their uh, status, not at all. He's using this phrase to express the absolute uh, submission as a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul uses that particular phrase, uh, servant of Christ. He's wanting the church to understand that the man who stands in the pulpit, who's called of God to be the minister of the church, he is a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian ministers are first and foremost called as servants of Christ in everything. They are subordinate and submissive to the Lord Jesus Christ. Church needs to understand that. This church at Corinth needed to understand what Paul is telling them. The church today needs to understand that their minister is a subordinate and is submissive to the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a galley slave. Christ owns the ship. Uh, We're called to serve the church. The minister is called to serve people. The minister is called to serve the church. But the minister cannot serve the church effectively unless he knows, or, or, or let me put it like this, unless he rightly serves the Lord first. The minister of the church cannot effectively and rightly serve the church unless he is serving the Lord rightly. Uh, Also, he cannot serve the Lord rightly unless he understands who he is in Christ, which according to the word that Paul uses here, he is an underslave. He is a servant uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why is Paul explaining this to the Corinthians? Because 
Paul's an apostle. Paul has apostolic authority. And Paul understands who he is in Christ. And Paul understands for these divisions to, to dry up, to go away, to be righted in the church. The church has to look at him and the other ministers with the right view. So he's explaining to them that even though he's an apostle, he himself understands that he is a galley slave. He is on the bottom of the boat rowing for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wants everyone else to understand and, con and, and consider him that slave for Christ too. Uh, not only him, but all of God's ministers. Galley slaves were not to be exalted over one another. Now see, this is what's going on in the church. When, when we say that there were divisions in the church, we're not talking about just preferences. Preferences are natural. Some, uh, uh, some like uh, different ministers for different reasons. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But these divisions caused rifts in the church and uh, stop the ministry from effectively reaching the community because Paul said in chapter 1 that there was jealousy and quarreling in the church. Friend, that ain't never good. That can't be good. So this is a serious problem, and Paul is trying to get them to look rightly at the minister, who the minister is in Christ, and understand that in the world of ministry, those who are ministers for Christ— there is no ranking. No, uh, no one is exalted over another one. Uh, they had a common rank, and it was low under the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul's point in explaining this uh, is that the Corinthians shouldn't follow one minister over another based on their preferences or criterias, uh, but consider them all slaves to Christ. Now, would that lower... Uh, how the church looked at a minister? Absolutely not. That would actually exalt that minister if he's rightly looked at because the church should understand that the man of God, uh, whether he's a pastor, whether he's an evangelist, whether he's a missionary, he is a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not the first time Paul points this out in Scripture. Matter of fact, all of his letters, uh, exp especially those, those prison epistles, calls attention that I am, a I am in chains for the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ didn't lock him up, but it was because of his love and passion and service for the Lord Jesus Christ that landed him in jail. So this is important to understand. Also, remember what Paul asked back in chapter 3, verse 5. He, he asked the church this. He says, what is Apollos? What is Paul? And he answers that. He asks them, but he answers it. He says, only servants. He calls their attention to who they're following, what the rifts are about, and then he asks the serious question, what am I? What is Apollos? Only servants, which means we're on the same level. We're on the same plane. Look, the senior pastor of the church uh, the the, inter, uh, the uh, associate pastor of the church or any other pastor that the church may have considering the size of the staff, uh, they may not all be on the same level as uh, the authority they have in the church. But when, when it comes to them ministering the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, they all fall into the same category. They are galley servants for the Lord Jesus Christ. One is not exalted above another. Uh, in verse uh, 5 of chapter 3, he asked this too. Uh, he says, what is Apollos, what is Paul, only servants through who you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each his task? Uh, another translation puts it like this as the Lord gave opportunity and power. Paul's really bringing it home now when it comes to ministers. Friend, listen, Paul understands that he is who he is because of the opportunities that the Lord Jesus Christ has given him. And he has the ability to take care or, or to uh, uh, 
uh, to take advantage of those opportunities because of the power that the Lord Jesus Christ gives him. I get this question all the time about this cowboy church, about how it came to be, and, 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 and it rose to where it's at very quickly. Uh, and a lot of times I'm given the credit, where, where, and, and that's not where the credit is due. And so my response to that question about uh, how the cowboy church just popped up overnight, uh, it was an opportunity given from the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and the success of it uh, is not because of me, it's because of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, it would probably be better to say uh, that it is successful in spite of me, uh, just to be honest with you. Uh, but Paul understands that uh, his position as an apostle is an opportunity given him of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, he describes himself in Scripture as an apostle born out of due time. Uh, so that opportunity come about by the Lord Jesus Christ and the things that Paul was able to do, the sermon that was uh, unequaled uh, that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. How, how did that happen? It happened through the power of the Holy Spirit. So Paul is pointing their attention to, look, we're, we're not one that, uh, that outranks anybody else. We're given opportunities by the Lord Jesus Christ. We're given the power uh, to take advantage of those opportunities also by the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, the glory goes to God. That's his point in saying all that. Paul's giving the churches an insight as to how they should regard the Lord's ministers. That went in the first century, and that also goes today in the 21st century. Each minister can only do what the sovereign Lord allows through opportunity and supplies through his power. I don't have the ability to do anything in the ministry on my own. The Lord has to give us the opportunity. Matter of fact, a long time ago, we, uh, we uh, decided that the best way for us to branch out and plant other churches and, and to do mission work and uh, to do ministry work on different levels is we decided the best way to do that was to follow the Blackaby method. And the Blackaby method is, is something that Henry Blackaby wrote in his, uh, his widely uh, known books, Experiencing God. He, he made this statement. He said, find out where God's working and go join him. Now, that's super simple, but it's also super effective. God gives the opportunity. I, I remember one time that uh, we were asked uh, early. We, we hadn't even got established yet. Uh, we didn't even have our own building. We were still over at the old campground building, and uh, we were trying to get our church up and going, and we were. We were doing good, but uh, we knew that when we started this church that our vision would be to plant other churches. And so someone come to us and said, hey, uh, where do you think a good opportunity or where do you think a good place is to plant another church. And, and we shared some ideas with it. The next thing I knew, they had us involved planting a church there. Uh, well, the church plant didn't go as well as any of our other church plants have went. Now we know uh, because uh, God didn't call us to go there. We went under our own umption, our own ideas, our own thoughts. God is the one who gives the opportunities. Uh, when we find out where God is working and go join him, then great things happen in the ministry. Paul wants uh, this Corinthian church to understand that as they look at the ministers and, and they're using their own criterias and, and evaluating the success of each, they need to understand that they're mere men who have been given the opportunity by sovereign God and who has been supplied the power uh, to take advantage of that opportunity. Second thing that we see here, uh, ministers, uh, how ministers should be regarded by the church uh, in verse 1. Let me just read it again. So then men ought to regard us as, number one, servants of Christ, number two, and as those entrusted with the secret things of God or the mysteries of God. 
Uh, those entrusted with the secret things of God, or the New American Standard says, stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, a steward is someone who's been entrusted with or over something. Uh, in this case, it's the secret things of God or the mysteries of God. Well, what in the world is the mysteries of God? A mystery is something, obviously, that's hidden, something that's unknown. And it, when, when it comes to knowing about God or things from God or of God, it takes a divine revelation or God himself to reveal them. So when Paul says that the church should regard ministers as those entrusted or stewards of the mysteries of God, here's what he's saying. Ministers have been entrusted to manage what God has revealed about himself through Scripture. Let me give you an example. Paul himself, in the book of Acts, Acts 20, verses 20 and 21, and then verse 27. Here's what he says. This is to the Ephesian church, by the way, the church at Ephesus. He says, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he finishes out in verse 27 by saying this, For I have not hesitated to proclaim the whole counsel or the whole will of God. What's he saying? The stewards of the mysteries of God, those ministers that's been called by God, are those who proclaim all of God's word to everyone who will listen in every place that they have an opportunity. Uh, everyone who will listen, black, white, red, yellow, green, every place God gives an opportunity, far or near, uh, they proclaim the whole counsel of God, not picking and choosing, I read an article today about a, a pastor who was interviewed, and uh, he said that he had just quit preparing exegetical sermons. He had just uh, started reading his Bible, and then his experiences in life is what he preached about. So if the subject was about lying, uh, the congregation would know that the pastor was struggling with lying. If the uh, sermon was about uh, adultery or any things like that, he would know, they would know that that was some experiences in his life. Of course, he fessed up that he would never preach nothing like that. Matter of fact, that was his point. I've never preached on their subjects. I don't think that's the best way. I don't think that's what God's called us to do. I think God has called us. Matter of fact, I know God has called us to preach the whole counsel of God. That's the point of the minister, uh, to share the hidden things of God that God has revealed through his holy word. Verse 2, third and final thing. Verse 2 says, Now, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. So, we've seen the identity of a minister in verse 1. He's a servant of Christ. He's a steward of God's mystery. And then here, we see the requirements of the ministry. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus, Paul also gives qualifications for ministers, qualifications for elders, qualifications for deacons. Uh, but that's, that's, that's not what he's talking about here. Here, uh, he refers uh, to a specific requirement for ministers. Paul is showing, now remember this, Paul is showing all this to the Corinthian church so they will know how to regard the ministers. It is required that those given a trust or stewards, as uh, one translation says, must be proven faithful or trustworthy. What's the most important quality of a good steward? It's pretty simple. It's faithfulness 
our trustworthiness. So God supplies his word. God supplies his spirit. God supplies his gift. God supplies his power to the minister. The minister is required to be faithful uh, using God's resources and taking the word of God and feeding it faithfully to his people. No one minister, no one minister outranks another minister. He may have in, in, in certain people's eyes a more successful ministry, but when he is faithful to the word of God, when he is faithful to live a holy life, when he is faithful to preach at the whole counsel of God, then that minister is a successful minister. The best a minister can offer is faithfulness. I may not have the talents of some preachers, and some preachers may not have the talents of me. God may not give me the opportunity he gives some pastors, but he may give me more opportunities than he gives some pastors. My part in the deal is to show my faithfulness, to be faithful to study God's word, be faithful in the word, be faithful to preach the whole counsel of God's word. Most of the time, people don't understand this about men who preach the gospel. They don't understand that the, the sermon that is written out is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, obviously, you can, you can go online and get you a sermon. You can just download somebody else's sermon. Uh, that, that, that ain't God's will for the minister. God's will for the minister is to preach all of his word the whole counsel of his word, to study that and, 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 and let it come into his heart and his mind so that he can share it just like I'm sharing right now. Let me sum this up and we'll close it out. The Corinthians were spiritually immature. We learned that from the very get-go in chapter 1. They operated out of the flesh, obviously, a lot. They had chosen to follow certain ministers, which was causing quarrels in the church. Jealous of each other is what they were. Uh, I can just imagine some of the conversations that went on between uh, the members of that church about certain ministers, uh, and that's probably where the quarreling broke out. Paul explained to them that their criteria of what makes a minister successful uh, and popular was not correct. The view of a minister was to be regarded as incorrect based on their criteria. But the view of how they regarded ministers was to be as servants of Christ, subject to him in all things, one common ranking, and that's under the Lord Jesus Christ, used only as, a, as God gave opportunity and supplied the power, and only offering faithfulness to use what God supplies, not for his glory, but for the glory of the Lord. So, uh, Paul, as we uh, move on through this chapter, you're going to see that Paul's going to use some language uh, next time we're together that's, that's not so nice. Uh, matter of fact, it's very forceful of what he says to them. But he wants to open their hearts and he wants to open their understanding as to how the man of God is called and why he's called and how he operates under Christ and how he's completely subordinate and submissive to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wants the, the church to understand that the man of God, the minister, his part in the calling is faithfulness, faithfulness in the word, faithfulness to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that uh, while we're going through this time of this virus, that you're being faithful, faithful to the Word. Can I just share with you from my heart and uh, from someone who loves you so much, this is a very vulnerable time for so many people. There's a purpose in being in God's house. There is a purpose for being with God's people. And right now, so many people are not in God's house. So many uh, Christians are not interacting with their brothers and sisters from Christ, which they're used to. And, and they're doing their own thing, and 
Uh, I know that sermons are going out, and uh, our sermons are getting two, three, four, five times many as views, uh, many more views uh, by way of the internet than it would be those who come in here. But I don't know that that makes us successful if we're not growing in God's Word, if we're not being challenged by God's Word, and more importantly, if we're not remaining faithful to God's Word. So my prayer is that you are remaining faithful in your prayer life, in your Bible study. And here's what you need to know. Even though church is not going on as usual, this church, and I'm sure all churches, the ministers are very much available. Me and Brother Chris are available always to you. Uh, I had a meeting with a, a lady yesterday who's visit, been visiting our church. We didn't meet in the church. Uh, we met at a very different place and uh, was able to help her through some things. She needed someone uh, to minister to her. And I want you to know this, uh, that even though things are different right now uh, in the ministry of Three Trees Cowboy Church, your pastors are still available to you. We're a phone call away, and you need to make that phone call uh, if we can be of some assistance to you. Faithfulness is a key to anyone's walk to the Lord. I pray tonight that first of all, you know the Lord Jesus Christ. Second of all, I pray that you're remaining faithful. Those who are faithful to the end, Scripture says, is the one that Christ looks for. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, friend, I just want to simply share with you, the Bible says salvation, clearly and simply, is for whosoever calls on his name. A couple of components, grace and faith. Not of works. Grace and faith. If your faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, follow him faithfully. Follow him. If me and Brother Chris or anyone here at the Cowboy Church can help you uh, with your uh, faith or if you need to know more about salvation, please look us up. Please give us a call. We would love to minister to you in any way that we can. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, the truth that's in it. We thank you for those apostles, Lord, like Paul, who built the foundation that we all stand on today. We're thankful for his heart to minister, to explain to the church, to love the church. And Father, we're thankful for these faithful scriptures that we get to study, Lord, that shapes us and molds us and makes us who we are to be in Christ. And Father, I thank you for this privilege again to teach your word. I pray, God, uh, that as your word says, it will not return void. I pray that it touches hearts and lives tonight. And Father, for that person who's watching by video tonight that might not know you, that might need someone to pray with them, someone to talk with them, someone to counsel with them. Lord, there may be that one that you're dealing with, Father, right now that's looking uh, for peace in their life, for hope in their life. Holy Spirit, I pray you don't let them sleep tonight until they reach out, get the information about you that they need. Lord, help us to help them. Connect us, O Lord, that you may receive the glory. We thank you, Father, that you are a God who provides during these times. And Lord, as we close this Bible study out, we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.